my talk is about how we use Airflow at a think tank actually to provide data um, that supports emerging technology analysis. Just a quick outline of my talk. I'm gonna start by just talking about the think tank question a little bit more and the different ways we use Airflow, then dive into a few specific Airflow use cases that we have and sum up with some lessons learned. So the think tank I work for is called the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. And we studied, as you might guess from the name, the security implications of different emerging technologies. So that includes AI, advanced computing, and biotech. Uh, the audience for our analyses are policymakers. The themes of the analysis are often geopolitical, and we're part of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. We have an effort within CSET called the Emerging Technology Observatory, and that builds public data resources, so web applications and some, some public data sets increasingly that we hope can help inform decisions on emerging technology issues. So just a little more detail about the things we build. One thing we build is just reports. Um, these are PDFs. Um, that are written by our analysts and read by policymakers. Uh, some of these reports draw on our data holdings and airflow pipelines keep the tables that are used in the, these analyses up to date. Another thing we build, as I said, was web applications. So these are public tools that policies, policymakers or their staff can use on a more self-serve basis to answer more granular questions. This is an example of one of our applications called the Map of Science. Um, this is based on over 100 million scholarly publications yeah, this is our map of science. It's um, based on over 100 million scholar scholarly publications, and it's meant to help our users better understand the research landscape. So answer questions like what areas of research are growing especially quickly, who are the key um, organizations that are producing research in those areas, and so on. And in this case, is Airflow pipelines move data from BigQuery uh, to Cloud SQL to um, form the back end of these applications. Our data team, it's about 14 people um, we, out of a 60 plus person organization. Uh, we have data research analysts whose job is to connect data to the non-technical subject matter expert analysts and help them write their reports. We have data scientists who have expertise in particular data sets and also do data set maintenance and data augmentation projects like training classifiers. And then we have currently one, we're hoping to hire another software engineer and a technical lead, that's me. And we do data pipeline maintenance and development and web application development. And then we have various other um, non-coding staff on the data team. Yeah, so how do we use Airflow? So right now we have about 93 DAGs running in Cloud Composer. We use GCP's managed Airflow. Um, we've used Airflow since 2020. Our, the tables we generate often range from hundreds of millions to billions of records. And the tasks that we do are often just ETL tasks, but we also do model deployment and also orchestrate longer running tasks like linkage and clustering. So I'll talk about kind of our most complex pipeline first, which is our scholarly literature pipelines. Um, we do a lot of analysis based on bibliometric data that backs like the map of science I mentioned earlier, for example. And th this kind of analysis can just be things like which companies are producing the most AI-related research or the most research in this domain of interest to me. Um, and to produce that data, we have to run a number of DAGs. That's ETL from our data vendors that provide like articles and metadata on those articles, like their titles, the people who contribute to them, and so on. We then link the articles across sources so we don't have like five different versions of an article if there's some duplication across vendors and then aggregate like canonical metadata for those articles. We run classifiers on the articles um, for particular topics of interest to identify relevant research, and then we cluster the articles. And this is just like a subset. This is probably not complex by some organization standards, but this is just like a subset of our, the different DAGs that make up our scholarly literature workflow. Um, to do this, most of our DAGs involve just using BigQuery operators to run large analytic queries. Um, we use BigQuery check operators to do data validation, just making sure that sometimes like our, our vendors will change the structure of the data on us and so on. And that just helps make sure things meet our expectations. Uh, we use cloud storage to store intermediate files and data flow operators to run, do parallelizable tasks like running inference or doing data cleaning that can be done easily in BigQuery. And then we use Kubernetes engine operators to run custom Python code. So mostly this works great for us. One challenge we did run into though is because we're kind of a research organization, sometimes we're just like given these big chunks of research code that maybe take several days to run and aren't easily decomposable without you know, doing a lot of re-architecture. So things like just doing data clustering. And we've tried various methods of running these with Airflow. We've tried Kubernetes engine operators and bash operators that just run commands over SSH. And sometimes this works great. Um, but other times, if we have run a task for several days, we might see a stack trace like this, you know, job heart begun an exception, 
connection to server failed, as you might expect, this is kind of an edge case, I guess, for Airflow. Um, the way we've worked around this is just using sensors. This is a little hacky, but it's worked okay. So in these cases where we have like a really large task that needs to run for several days, we'll just run that task in the background on a remote VM. And then when it completes, it uploads an empty file to a location on cloud storage. Um, and then we use a GCS object extent sensor to, to wait for that file to appear and then allow the DAG to proceed once it's present. This works okay for us. It is kind of clunky. There's various issues like having to SSH to the VM to like look at the logs, which isn't great, but we're looking into other solutions, but this is what we're doing for now. I'm gonna pivot a little bit to talk about how we've abstracted away Airflow in some, for some use cases. So it definitely has a learning curve. Um, there's been a lot of enthusiasm across our data team for learning Airflow, but not everybody's work really focuses on building data pipelines. Um, and maybe if, if, if it doesn't, it can be kind of hard to justify the amount of time it takes to get really spun up on Airflow. So we identified some common use cases, one of which is just running a sequence of analytic SQL queries, updating their documentation and backing them up. So to do this, uh, we, we use dynamic DAG generation. So we have just a script that configures for people like a directory where they can put their SQL queries, a file that specifies the order those queries should be run in, another directory where they can write their checks, um, a directory for schemas where they can do column level documentation, and then just a simple bash script to copy all these artifacts up to uh, cloud storage where Cloud Composer can use them. Um, and then given these inputs, we can we dynamically generate DAGs. Um, there's a, this is probably pretty uh, familiar to most people, but if it isn't, there's really good uh, documentation from Astronomer on how to do this. So a little bit more detail on how this works. We look in a sequence directory under uh, the DAGs folder on, GC, on uh, Cloud Composer for uh, CSVs that contain these sequences of queries. And then we use the names of those files to configure a DAG that uh, run, runs those queries in order. And then once that DAG is configured, we insert it into the global namespace. So just a big block of code, but the salient part is this line where we just read um, this file that, that specifies where the different SQL queries are and then just runs them in series. So this has actually worked okay for us. Um, for people who are more um, just do analytic support work, this doesn't require any knowledge of airflow. It reduces the number of boiler play DAGs that we have to create. Um, it can still be a little overwhelming for people. There's just still a lot of components that need configuration. And if you don't understand how like the underlying scripts are working, that can be a little difficult to, to grok. But. Um, other cases where we've used dynamic DAG generation are just data ETL. Sometimes our vendors will have like conceptually, they'll have like several different tables that they deliver us to us maybe on different schedules and with slightly different configurations. And we found that it's helpful to just have a separate DAG generated for each of those, those tables that we can run on different schedules and have different visibility into and configuration into. Um, another thing we do a lot of is just web scraping and at a certain level of abstraction, most web scrapers are similar. You, you can pull down um, the HTML of a, of a site gathered in one way or another and then you run parsers on that HTML. So we just write all our web scrapers to have this, this similar structure and then can automate them using uh, dynamically generated DAGs and some configure files. And then another thing we do a lot of is integrating human data annotation, which is the thing I'll talk about next. So several of our workflows um, in include analysts. We're lucky being at a university, we have a lot of students who can help us um, do data annotation tasks and so on. Um, and to do tasks like this, we place a set of records into Airtable, either manually or through an Airflow pipeline I'll talk about in a minute. Then humans clean or add additional metadata to those records, and then we ingest the records back into BigQuery on a regular basis. So to do this, again, we use dynamic DAG generation. Um, we have separate DAGs for like, or separate DAG generation scripts for BigQuery to Airtable workflows and then Airtable to BigQuery workflows. So the users can write configuration files that specify like which, how to rename columns, which columns to exclude from when you're copying from one environment to another. Like uh, they, the config files will point to a SQL query that specifies how data should be merged together um, and how like new records and old records should be rationalized and so on. And these DAGs are generate, can be generated from, or can be triggered from other DAGs that need to interact with Airtable or they can just be scheduled to run on their own. 
So an example of how we use this is to update our manual entity resolution table. So our raw data contains a bunch of different variants of organization names, just things like International Business Machines Corporation and IBM United States. And there's a bunch of, obviously this is a common problem, and there's a bunch of solutions in progress, including a really great project called the Research Organization Registry that maps different organizational aliases to like a canonical ID. And then we, we have our own internal model-based ER effort. But in the meantime, we need to manually kind of clean up the worst offenders while we wait for these projects to, to deal with them. So to do this, on a regular basis, we just add worst offender organizations. This may be just by number of affiliated paper papers or other metrics to an Airtable base. And then those can be manually mapped to like the canonical name and canonical ROAR ID if available. And then a reviewer will just check a reviewed column. And then an Airflow pipeline every, every week or so pulls organizations that have that column checked and uses them to update a big query table. And then those cleaned organizations are available for other DAGs like our metadata merging DAG. So just to sum up some lessons learned. We're a really small organization, obviously, and we started as just a data engineering team of like me, and then we evolved from there. Now several people across our data team use Airflow. And so we had to deal with issues just like how to assign responsibility for addressing minor vendor schema updates and, and so on, and just giving everybody on the data team visibility into task failures and lineage and so on. And what's been really helpful for us is just a shared Slack channel that Airflow writes to that we can like write our own status messages in um, and with like points of contact for each DAG uh, identified and people get DM'd when their, their DAG fails and so on. Um, we've, as I said, we have to put some special consideration into running these long running tasks and dynamically generating DAGs have been a big help for us, keeping, just keeping our code dry and helping the team members generate DAGs without having to learn the details of Airflow.